performance artist, would you say? <laughs> I, I guess so. Definitely yes. a performance <laughs> artist. From Chicago. From, from Chicago. She made it where, where the Cubs well. just won. Uh, if yes, you can believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 How are you doing, bro? Everyone, <laughs> welcome Janet Kuiper. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> That's what I get. Uh, cool story. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was at the uh, Kick Butt Coffee Open Poetry Open Mic, and I had read a poem that I wrote a long time ago called One Summer, and it was about travel that I had done throughout these states. And I got complimented on this long poem, and that inspired me to write this new piece that I've never read before, and uh, it's called One Spring. It's a long one, it's all. My subtitle for it is Seven Countries in Seven Days. <laughs> it was a busy seven days. One, Austria. When walking through the 60 degree slanted streets in Austria, you understand quickly why walking Europeans are thinner than us fat Americans. We drive everywhere, then pay money to use a gym to help us lose weight gain from this rich life. I saw Mozart references everywhere, and it was great to be in Salzburg, the town where this genius musician was born. But while looking for a place to eat, I saw Salzburger listed in many diner signs. I asked if this was a kind of hamburger, and they told me no, it's a reference to being from Salzburg. So I laughed and I said, I guess Mozart's a Salzburger? But, but being at the Alps, everything was at this inclined hike. I tried to climb a mountain in the snow in my sandals. So I attempted relief for my aching joints by resting in the Gastein curative tunnel. You see, this tunnel's a tourist spot because miners would feel rejuvenated after working in it until they realized that the tunnel was loaded with radon. And sure, long-term exposure might be bad, but after sweating the buckets of water while laying down in for these tunnels and mines for 20 minutes, you actually did feel relaxed, better, but rejuvenated and ready to climb a mountain tomorrow. To Germany. We left Hitler's home country to go to Germany's Dachau to see one of the first concentration camps in existence. Drank beer on the train ride from Munich, something Hitler would frown upon. And after seeing Washington DC's Holocaust Memorial that was complete with train car, a Warsaw ghetto walkway, glass bins of collected hairbrushes, shoes, I was stoked for the impact of actually being there. But once we passed under the Arbeit Max Frey sign, we walked into vast blank halls with only occasional spots of original chipped paint. We'd rock from room to room, each containing only large hanging posters with occasional images of data in German and in English. You couldn't feel the gravity of the life for these prisoners in these camps. Only when we got to the last room and saw a scale model of the entire grounds as it was during the Holocaust, well, everywhere we'd walked an entire day was only about one-fifth of the size of the camp. That was the only way I saw the monstrous size of this monstrosity. Later, at a Munich bar, I was at this Munich bar and these old German men yelled at us in German when an American-sounding song played on the jukebox. I didn't even know where the jukebox was, and the bartender yelled at the regulars in German that she was the one that chose that song. But looking back, I have to admit, it was cool to be yelled at in another language from men on the other side of the planet. <laughs> this is three. Italy. We walked through the remains of Pompeii after Mount Vesuvius did its damage in 79 AD. After crossing the Tyrrhenian Sea, I actually hugged a column in Sicily from Agrigento's preserved Greek column ruins. After circling the Colosseum in Rome on those cobblestone roads through the Vatican City, we had bad pizza in Napoli before making our final stop to party at the watery town of Venice. 
The buildings were colorful and the water was everywhere. Stairs went from the sidewalks to the sea. And for the tourists, there was even a row of gondolas waiting to take them on a water ride. But as I said, this was a tourist trap down and everything has a price. Uh, the only trinket I bought was a glass globe of grappa. <laughs> And really, that stuff tastes awful. <laughs> because we didn't know if we could take alcohol over country lines, we bought a bottle of diet soda to mask the grappa and chug it down so they wouldn't confiscate my glass globe. Of course, no one searched us for contraband, but we didn't know any better, and it was a cute excuse for drinking that grappa because I kept that bottle, and I still look at it every day, and it makes me smile. France. We saw beautiful buildings in this beautiful city of Paris, and people were nice to us, even though we didn't know a word in French. But we had money, and currency is the only language we all understand. I visited the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, the Notre Dame, but, but the one thing I remember the most is that when sitting in cafes outdoors, tables for two always had the two chairs not opposite each other, but facing the street. Do people watch? I still do that here, now, if I get the chance. You can hear someone talking when they're right next to you, and this way you can look out and watch the world. This is the Netherlands Five. The architecture in Brussels was really amazing, but in Amsterdam we searched for pot, but it was only in coffee shops, and coffee's not the drug for me. Uh, the man at the hotel looked at my passport with my Dutch name and pronounced it differently, so we went to the streets to find some nightlife. Uh, we did see some prostitutes on display for business while posing in literal window boxes of buildings at eye level when you walk down the street. But beyond that, the bars closed at 10 p.m. And lucky you, every bar had fewer than four people in them. So as one bar that we went to, we got one round of drinks before they closed that cost us nearly 30 euros. And then we took our only other option, which was to go to a Mexican restaurant and get a half liter of Heineken as long as we ordered food. The only food we got was tomato soup, which was a fitting nightcap for a town the tourists seemed to rave about. And sure, we saw the Anne Frank House and the Vincent Van Gogh's Museum, but at this point, it was really time to move on. <coughs> I don't have enough fingers for six. This is, <laughs> this is Luxembourg. In a country with too many letters in its name to fit on most maps, this tiny little place tried to make up for it with culture and history, which was a relief when the weather became warmer, and for the first time on my trip, I was able to wear shorts. And for all of the studying I had done about different cultures, the one thing I didn't learn was that women in European countries like Luxembourg never, and I mean never, wear shorts. <laughs> So I was walking down the street there, and women were looking at me like I was a whore, and businessmen all gave me this perverted grin. Mortified and unable to change, we stopped at a bar for lunch, and I tried to hide my legs, and then a huge flux of male workers came in for lunch. I mean, I liked Luxembourg, but on that one day, all I could do was do anything in my power to hide my legs from the rest of the world. Last one, seven, Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland. And sure, I have a Swiss Army knife, and sure, I might have a thing for chocolate. But when you get away from the Alps, which are 60% of the land, the terrain looks like the Midwest United States. Uh, away from Zurich, the terrain looks like Ohio, Indiana, Iowa. Same hills, same foliage, same expanse, looking for something new. And all that remained to carry was a big backpack of trinkets and far too many memories to cherish before they slip away.